first of all, thank you uh, for, for those of you who came back. Thanks, thanks for coming, coming back. I'm really gratified by that. Uh, uh, let me quickly, very quickly recap sort of the main ideas from yesterday's uh, talk, which was that uh, I think an adequate moral theory, at least as far as value theory goes, the way of evaluating better or worse outcomes, is going to need to be a hierarchical theory, one in which uh, we say, roughly and crudely, people have a higher moral status uh, than uh, animals do, and even among animals, we'd have to distinguish uh, between uh, various levels or statuses of animals, so that you know, chimps clearly count more than, so it seems to me, more than uh, dogs do, dogs more than uh, you know, mice do. Uh, I'm not sure what, where fish would stand vis-a-vis -vis mice, but perhaps lower um, uh, insects further down. And that by virtue of these differences in moral standi standing or moral status more particularly, um, it will turn out that uh, for example, egalitarian claims need to be adjusted to take these kinds of status differences into account, or other distributive principles need to be adjusted. I suggested maybe even more controversially that even if we simply focus on well-being uh, and talk about uh, how much good does it do to improve the outcome, to add X units of well-being, uh, we need to... I ask, well, whose well-being? What kind of creatures' uh, uh, well-being? Even if we just talk about units of, of well-being. As an analogy, for those of you familiar with the priority view, where uh, it's more important to help those at the bottom, that's really the same kind of idea at work, right? Where you say a unit of well-being given to somebody who's very badly off adds more value to the outcome than a unit of well-being given to somebody uh, well off. Uh, and so, similarly, I want to say a unit of well-being given to uh, a creature with a high moral status adds more good to the world or more value to the outcome than a unit of well-being given to uh, a creature further down. Um, so, so that's the kind of position I was uh, sketching last time. And uh, the reason last yesterday's talk was called Consequentialism for Cows was because I was mostly thinking about value theory and how do you assess the goodness of outcomes. And if you're a consequentialist, that's all you really need. You kind of say, okay, the right thing to do is bring about the best outcome. And then what I was urging was that we need to have a hierarchy sensitive value theory in terms of assessing outcomes. Most people are not, in fact, consequentialists. At least that's, I, I don't know, this is Oxford. Maybe that's not true here at Oxford. Uh, if I was in Australia, I'd be confident it was false. Um, but uh, most people are not uh, uh, consequentialists. They're deontologists. Uh, and again, I don't know exactly what kind of philosophy background everybody in the audience has got. So I may be a little bit too explanatory uh, for some people. But the rough idea behind deontology is that there are certain things that need to be taken into account in fixing the moral status of your action besides just the results, besides just the consequences. Certain actions can be wrong even though the consequences are good. And to give a, a familiar kind of example to illustrate that point, um, just to show you that, you know, oh yeah, this is the kind of deontological intuition that a lot of people have, uh, you have to ask yourself, would it be okay to deliberately, knowingly kill an innocent person, chop them up, use their organs to save some larger number of people, perhaps five people, you know, give one person the heart, one person the lung, another person you know, the liver, and so forth? Most people have the very strong judgment that would be wrong to kill an innocent person, even though the results would be good. Uh, and, and so that's a kind of expression of a deontological thought. Uh, and all right, so what I want to do today is to argue that deontologists also need to introduce uh, hierarchy uh, theory. You'll recall that the foil I've been discussing, uh, contrasting the view I'm sympathetic to, is some, a position I called Unitarianism, according to which animals count too. Um, so we're not really here worrying about the, trying to convert the skeptics who say animals don't count at all. Assuming that animals do have moral standing, do they have exactly the same status that you and I have? That's what the Unitarians say. Or do they count less, which is what, what we hierarchy theorists uh, uh, want to say. All right, so suppose that you're a Unitarian, but it's also the case that when you've been doing your normative ethics, figuring out your basic moral principles with regard to people, you're a deontologist. 
So if, if, if animals count and have the very same moral status that people have, and people fall under a deontological moral framework, uh, then it would follow, of course, that animals fall under a deontological moral framework uh, as well. And if you're a Unitarian, it's the very same deontological framework. Uh, and so what I'm going to be doing initially is trying to argue that that's not plausible. And as always with these kinds of arguments, you know, the thing that doesn't strike me as acceptable may strike you as acceptable. All the relevant positions here are going to have intuitive costs that will bother somebody. Uh, maybe even every position will bother you a little bit. You have to decide which position bothers you the least. All I'm going to be doing is saying, here are some implications of Unitarian deontology which strike me as unacceptable. Um, and so it seems to me going into a hierarchy direction is, is, is the right way to go. But we'll consider some alternatives uh, as well, because it's a particular hierarchy direction I think a deontologist needs to go, as opposed to some alternatives, which might uh, be worth considering as well. All right, so again, okay. so the, 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 the basic kind of intuition behind deontology is something like, or at least it's a, a central example of it, that it's wrong to, for example, kill uh, an innocent person, uh, even though uh, the results of doing that might be good. Now, admittedly, this, and this is going to be important for what comes in a, in a, in a minute or two, uh, there are some deontologists are want to say, you know, it's wrong to kill the innocent person no matter what. Um, no matter how much good you could do. In the little example, the mock example I gave a minute ago where you could chop up somebody and use their organs to save you know, a handful of people, uh, the deontologist says, you know what? The, the fact that you could save five people, although that would admittedly be better to have five people alive than, than just the one person alive, that's not enough of a justification. Uh, so the, uh, it's wrong to kill an innocent person. They have a right to life, as we might put it, that outweighs the possibility of doing the, the good of five. But suppose we made the number ten. Suppose we made the, uh, the number of lives that you could save, or a hundred, or a thousand, or ten thousand, or a hundred thousand, or a million, or what have you. Um, a lot of people at a certain point begin to say, ah, I don't know, that's an awful lot of good. And if the only way that we could save you know, a million people was to, uh, was to uh, kill an innocent person, maybe at that point it really would ju be justified. So you've got two schools of thought among the, uh, the deontologists. You've got, on the one hand, the absolutists uh, who think that no amount of good could justify killing an innocent person. And you've got uh, what I think of as moderate deontologists, enough good. There's a threshold at which point when there's that much good at stake, it's permissible to, to kill the innocent person. All right, so suppose we start off by being absolutist deontologist, Unitarians, all right? Okay, so what that means, of course, is that you cannot kill a person no matter how much good you would do. Uh, and so for Unitarians, we have to say, so you cannot kill an animal no matter how much good you would do. And all I can say is when I think about cases like that, that just seems to me to be the wrong answer. Um, uh, so to use a kind of example I'll be reverting to several times over the, you know, the next chunk of the, of, of the talk, you know, suppose that uh, you've been cast away on an island. Uh, no civilization, you're the only, only human there. Um, this is like, uh, I was just discussing this, this is like Tom Hanks on, in Castaway, for those of you who, who've seen that, right? So, so Tom Hanks is stuck on this island for years and years and years, and the only thing he can do is to, you know, keep himself alive by killing an occasional fish. Or imagine that there are deer on the island, and so um, the way you keep yourself alive is by killing a deer. Now, according to the Unitarian, absolutist deontologist, we have to say that just as it would be wrong to kill a person, no matter how much good it would do, it's wrong to kill the deer or kill the fish, no matter how much good it would do. And in particular, the good that you're doing of saving you know, Tom Hanks, uh, that's just not enough of a justification. It doesn't outweigh the right to life of the animal, which is every bit as strong as the right to life that you have, if Unitarianism is right, and you have an absolute right to life says the absolutist deontologist. So that would mean Tom Hanks can't kill an occasional fish. Uh, I just can't believe that that's the right thing to do, if that's the only way to stay alive. So I think absolutist deontology, Unitarianism, isn't going to fly. 
Now, the fact of the matter is, as I pointed out a moment ago, a lot of deontologists are not actually absolutists. Uh, most people are, based on my you know, talking to people over the years, most people who are deontologists are actually moderate deontologists. And they start thinking, well, you know, if there was a billion lives that could be saved, then, yeah, it would be permissible. And the question is, where's the threshold? And sometimes with my students, if we had more time, I, I could do with you what I do with my students, which is I ask you to put up your hands. You know, is it okay to kill the innocent person now to save, you know, a thousand lives? And some of you will have your hands up. How about a million lives? Or, um, and, you know, and, and if we did that, we'd probably discover there's a handful maybe of absolutists in the room, but most of you would be moderates, so there'd be a lot of disagreement about where the threshold was. But I suppose that we are moderate deontologists, Unitarians, can we at least now say, ah, okay, look, now the good that we're doing when we save Tom Hanks's life, or the good that he does when he saves his own life, that's enough to meet the threshold for the right to life. Well, in principle, we could say that, but in fact, given the kind of thresholds that most people have, at least here's a kind of initial take on moderate deontology, it's still not going to go. So when I do these uh, uh, you know, little exercises with my students, you know, nobody's willing to say, I don't mean literally nobody, there's always some consequentialists or utilitarians in, in, in my students, but most people aren't prepared to say it's okay to kill an innocent person to say five or ten or a hundred. You don't really start getting action until you get up to a thousand. By a thousand people, all right, a lot of people say, okay, maybe a thousand's enough. A lot of them, it's not enough, but so a thousand, maybe that's enough. Ten thousand, all right. Let's be, let's be very modest and think that a thousand is where the threshold is at. So suppose we agree as moderate deontologists that it is permissible to kill an innocent person if that's the only way. It's got to be necessary. Of course, you can't do it gratuitously if there's an alternative. But if the only way to save a thousand people is to kill an innocent person, maybe that's permissible. If you think that number isn't high enough, that's just going to be grist for my mill. So I'm trying to be generous here to the moderate deontological Unitarian. Suppose it takes as little as a thousand lives. And how is it okay for Tom Hanks to kill the fish? Well, no, because of course, maybe it would be okay to kill the fish or kill the deer or something like that if it would save a thousand lives. But it's not saving a thousand lives, it's just saving Tom Hanks' life. Uh, and so, again, at least on this simple version of moderate deontology, if you're Unitarian, you still have to say, Tom Hanks can't eat the fish, can't kill the fish, can't kill the deer, and that just seems to be the wrong answer. So at least this simple version of moderate deontology won't work either. Now, there are more sophisticated or complicated versions of moderate deontology, and they say something like this. Actually, before we get to that or to motivate it, we'll say, look, suppose instead of having to kill an innocent person to save five lives, what you had to do was harm them in some way. You know, chop off an arm. I don't, these things are very grotesque, but, uh, you know, some if you chop off an arm, there's a, there's a, there's a disease that the five people have, uh, and uh, uh, the antibodies are coursing through, you know, your victim's uh, body, and if you chop off the arm, you can extract enough of the antibody to make a serum that would allow you to, you know, save the five, right? So then you wouldn't have to kill him. Is that okay? Well, you know, we, we, we could take it to a poll, and probably most of you would still say, nah, harm's not okay. And, and I could make the harm smaller. What if all you had to do was chop off, you know, three fingers to save five people? Would that be okay? You know, what if all you had to do was chop off, you know, the, the, the little toe? You know, would that be okay? As we make the harm smaller, now, of course, an absolutist deontologist here was going to say, I don't care how small you make the harm. It's never going to be okay. You know, you know, how, you know, how dare you, you know, punch this guy in the nose to save five lives? You know, no amount of good could justify that kind of teeny weeny little harm. And how dare you tickle the person against his will? So there are people who, who say this sort of thing. I, 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 as I said, I'm not myself a deontologist. So I'm doing my best to think my way through what does a deontologist have to have available to them. All right, so there are you know, absolutist deontologists, even as we shrink the, the harm down to almost nothing. But what most moderate deontologists find is if you, as you make the harm smaller, the threshold gets lower. And so 
yeah, the amount of harm that I would need, the amount of good that I would need to do to justify killing somebody might be the equivalent of saving a thousand or ten thousand or a million lives. But the amount of lives I would need to save to justify, you know, punching you in the nose, obviously, much, much, much less. Again, not everybody believes that, but a lot of people believe that. So on that more complicated, moderate, deontological view, the threshold isn't a constant amount. It's a function of the amount of harm that you're imposing on the innocent victim. Okay, so that's the key thought. As the amount of harm goes down, I think I should do this from your side, as the amount of harm goes down, the, the level of the threshold goes down, the amount of good you would need to do to justify uh, overriding their right not to be harmed uh, uh, goes down as well. So suppose we have that kind of harm-sensitive function as, as our relevant version of moderate deontology, can at least we say now we have a justification for Tom Hanks? Because after all, remember the Unitarian point, which I certainly believe this aspect of Unitarianism, remember the Unitarian point from uh, uh, yesterday that, look, uh, humans, because of all the greater goods that we're capable of achieving and do achieve in, in our lives, have much more at stake uh, than animals do. Uh, so when you kill the deer, you're causing less harm because it's losing less than when you kill you know, me or you. Uh, and same, same thing indeed maybe in spades. Uh, when you kill the fish, you're causing even less harm. And so if the threshold is a function of the amount of harm you're doing by killing the, the animal, then we might at this point hope, okay, now keep in mind that the animals lose a whole lot less. You know, it wouldn't have been okay for Tom Hanks to uh, kill, you know, if he, he finds, like a Robinson Crusoe, he finds Friday on the island, right? So he kills Friday. Um, no, that wouldn't be okay because Friday is losing a whole lot. But when he kills the deer or kills the fish, there's a lot less lost, a lot smaller harm imposed. And so the amount of good that needs to be done is proportionally less. And so now we can hold out the hope that, okay, the amount of good that's being done, saving Tom Hanks' life, that's great enough to meet the threshold. All right, that seems promising. Unfortunately, I think that still won't do. I mean, not unfortunately for me. I'm trying to argue that it won't do. But unfortunately for the moderate... Unitarian deontologist, I think it still won't do. So, of course, what exactly that's like depends on what exactly is the threshold function like. And that's, I'll say a little bit more about that in, 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 uh, later in the talk. But, again, starting with the thought that you know, maybe you could kill an innocent person to save a thousand lives... So there's a certain loss. Suppose we're talking about just stereotypical people, right? Not so that one of them's got more well-being than the other or something. Just stereotypical people. Then it's something like, the, as, as a first approximation, the function is something like you know, the threshold equals you know, a thousand times the amount of harm imposed, right? I can impose the loss of a life if that's the only way to save a thousand lives, a thousand times the amount of harm that I was imposing. So, so we could have you know, a fairly simple, for those of you who were here yesterday, you wonder, why is this here? That was here so that I could do this. Uh, and those of you over here, you won't be able to see it. Um, uh, yeah, but I'm not going to, at this point, say anything especially uh, complicated. Um, it's that the amount of good you've got to do to justifiably harm an innocent is a thousand times as much as the harm that you're imposing. Okay, suppose that's right. So now we have to ask ourselves, okay, how much harm was I imposing on the deer, suppose it was the deer, when I kill it, and how much good was Tom Hanks achieving when he, when he kills the deer? Okay, so to actually pursue this, it turns out I needed to learn something about deer, which I knew nothing about. Uh, so, I mean, so after all, one question is, well, look, killing one deer doesn't keep Tom Hanks alive forever. Right? It only provides enough sustenance for a certain period of time. How much, how much can a typical person stay alive by killing you know, a standard white-tailed deer? So I looked it up. And, of course, estimates vary, um, but you know, something like a year. Now, immediately, 
And that, there's enough flesh on a deer carcass uh, to keep a human, to feed a human for uh, a year as long as the food doesn't spoil. So what we now need to do is introduce a freezer onto Tom Hanks's island uh, so that the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the meat will last long enough. Or we could tweak the example by having a bunch of other people who, you know, they, they kill a deer, you know, periodically, and then they share the deer. But, uh, all right, so, but forget that. Suppose we got the freezer. So, um, you've got Tom Hanks being kept alive for a year by having killed one deer. What did the deer suffer? Okay. Um, well, how long do deer last for? And it turns out different species of deer have different average lifespans, but you take, I don't know, whatever a white-tailed deer is, and it's something like 20 years. So suppose that Tom Hanks kills a average deer. Uh, that means he's, on average, robbing the deer of 10 years of deer life. Okay? All right. So that means that Tom Hanks, so as to get the good of one year of Tom Hanks's life, is imposing a loss of ten, year of de- 10 years of deer life. How much good, according to the fancy schmancy uh, moderate deontologist, does Tom Hanks need to be doing? He needs to be doing a thousand times the amount of harm that he's imposing. So he was imposing the loss of 10 years deer life. Well, 10 times 1,000 is obviously 10,000. And so in order to meet the threshold, the sophisticated moderate deontologist Unitarian has to be saying that the good that befalls Tom Hanks by keeping himself alive for one year is the equivalent of 10,000 deer years. Now, of course, I was agreeing, and I was reminded of the Unitarian claim that that human lives are more valuable than uh, uh, animal lives, have more good uh, in them, so Tom Hanks, you know, a year of Tom Hanks has more value at stake than a year of dear life. Uh, maybe it's got more value than you know five years of dear life or ten years of dear life. You know, if you do, if you try putting numbers on this and ask, you know, if, if a typical year of human life is worth a hundred well-being points, how many points is a typical year of dear life worth? Is it worth twenty? Is it worth ten? Right. The only way the moderate deontologist is going to be able to justify Tom Hanks, moderate deontologist Unitarian, going to be able to justify Tom Hanks killing the deer is if the deer's life is less than one ten thousandth as valuable as you know, a year of your life. Now, there's nothing logically inconsistent about saying that, but I find it very hard to believe that anybody who actually take seriously the thought that animals count, that their well-being is real, it can be measured up against human well-being. Um, it's a logical possibility, but this doesn't strike me as plausible. So even the moderate deontologists with their threshold can't say that there's enough good done, given the 1,000 multiplier, to justify uh, 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 killing, killing the deer. And again, that just seems to me unacceptable. So I think... Being a deontologist who's a Unitarian just isn't a live option. Again, it's it's coherent. Probably some people here will uh, will, will want to say, no, that is the way to go. There are other moves to make that I haven't suggested. But at least maybe I've said enough to help you see why. It seems to me there's tremendous pressure if you are going to be a deontologist to introducing hierarchy within your moral theory. Okay. Now there's a at least two interesting ways that we could try to introduce hierarchy within our moral theory as deontologists. Again, I'm just dismissing the view that says animals don't count at all. There are deontologists who say animals don't count at all in their own right. Not just any old deontologist, Mr. Deontologist, Immanuel Kant thought that. But, you know, he's forced to say that, you know, like, remember when you ripped off the orchid, that was bad because it was hurting other people. You know, Kant is forced to say things like, um, yeah, when you set the cat on fire with gasoline, um, that's not, you're not wronging the cat, uh, but, you know, you really shouldn't do it. 
I don't know why, it makes you more likely to set other people on fire with gas. I mean, it seems, it seems very implausible to me. And of course, it seems implausible to almost all contemporary Kantians, which is why contemporary Kantians typically bend over backwards to figure out how within Kantian machinery to generate the claim that animals do count after all. So okay, I'm going to suppose animals count. So we're not going to exclude them from morality, but it could be that we should exclude them from deontology. This would be to adopt a kind of hierarchy theory where creatures like you and me, people, we have certain deontological claims. We have deontological rights. It's wrong to kill us unless this huge greater amount of good could be done. Animals can't be neglected. It can't be that they don't count, but they don't count in a deontological way. How might they count? Well, maybe they count in the way that utilitarians, foolishly, say the deontologists, think that people should count. Right? You know, so it could be that when it comes time to uh, talk about you know, killing or sacrificing an innocent deer, it's okay to kill one deer to save five deer. You, know, you do a kind of strict measurement of the good trade-off calculation. So to give the position a kind of label, um, it would be as though we had utilitarianism for animals and deontology for people. Those of you who've read Anarchy, State, and Utopia, Robert Nosek's wonderful book, might recognize this as a position that he puts forward there. He calls it, I think, utilitarianism for animals, uh, Kantianism uh, for people. Uh, but I think you know, the, my alteration of the slogan, I think, is probably more perspicuous. And actually, in fairness to Nozick, that's not the position he himself believes, but I think it actually captures something like what I'm tempted to call the common sense view about, about morality. Maybe it would be better to call it the enlightened common sense view. Maybe not fully enlightened, but at least the semi-enlightened common sense view about morality. Because I'm not sure that common sense, what it thinks about how much animals count. Uh, but at least, you know, among those of us who've come on board in thinking that animals count, but we don't really think that they have the same deontological rights you and I have. Uh, they're not governed by deontological principles. They're governed by some more basic, less uh, complicated uh, uh, moral theory. So utilitarianism for animals, uh, deontology for people. That's, that's, that's a, a, a thought. And if you had that view, that would obviously be a hierarchy view. So for the purposes of saying, look, deontologists can't be Unitarians, you know, then I'm done, even if you adopt this view. And, that view, and this view, after all, the, the Nozickian view, allows you to say it's okay for Tom Hanks to... Uh, kill the deer, kill, uh, eat the fish, as long as the good that he's getting is more than the harm that he's imposing on the deer, and that seems you know, that seems pretty likely. At least, you know, all you have to say at that point is, as long as a human life is more than ten times as good as a deer life, then the amount of benefit he's gaining by killing the deer is greater than the harm he's imposing. And so that kind of Deontology for people, uh, utilitarianism for animals views, allows you to avoid having to multiply the deer harm by a thousand because we've excluded the deer from deontology. Yeah, well, that's right if we can come up with grounds for excluding the deer from deontology. Now, of course, at this point, what we really need to ask is, okay, so just what is it that makes it true from the point of view of deontologists that we have the kind of standing that, that supports giving us the protections of deontology. I mean, the picture here has got to be that there's some feature that we have that makes deontology the appropriate expression or reflection of that feature, uh, but the animals lack it, and so they don't have deontological standing at all, although they do have moral standing. And, and obviously, to do justice to this question, you'd now need to run through you know, a half dozen alternative views that have been proposed about what's the feature that we've got. But instead of dragging out all of the usual suspects, let me just drag out probably the most common candidate here, which is to say that people are autonomous. Now, autonomy has something to do with, and of course, people differ about the details of how you spell out this idea, but autonomy has something to do with the fact that you've got a conception about how you want to live your life. Uh, you um, can set various ends for yourself. You're not a mere puppet, uh, uh, etc. Um, 
So you set ends, as, as Kantians like to put it. Uh, you choose, you know, what, how, to, how to live your life accordingly. All right, so the thought then is that uh, we are autonomous, uh, and so somehow deontology is supposed to flow from our autonomy. Deer, fish, flies, and the like are not autonomous, and so they don't get the, the protections of deontology. Yeah, of course, in a full discussion of moral theory, you then might ask, what is it about autonomy that makes it plausible to think that it would generate deontology? As it happens, I've already confessed to you, I'm not myself a deontologist, so I don't think anything makes it plausible to get from autonomy to deontology. But since what I'm trying to talk about here is not what's wrong with deontology, but rather what kind of a position should deontologists take about animals, let's just suppose that it's plausible to think that autonomy grounds deontology. Instead, what I want to poke at and put pressure on is the crucial next step, which is that, so we have autonomy and animals don't. Because what really seems to me to be a more accurate description is autonomy comes in degrees, and animals have it to a greater or lesser degree. Look, so, so what is it to have autonomy again? Well, sometimes people start talking about having a life plan, about what you want to do, right? You have long-term goals, future regarding, sometimes past regarding uh, as well, and not just involving one tiny little aspect of your life, but, but uh, involving all sorts of different aspects of your life, and you're aware of yourself as having these plans and so forth. Now, that's all very grand, and let's suppose that that does generate deontology, but you could have things like that to lesser degrees. You could have preferences about what happens to you without having this big, grand notion of what's my entire life going to be like, um, right? I mean, you could have views about what you're going to do for the next four years in college or graduate school or what have you with having a notion about what's going to happen to me beyond that. Well, you know, you could have views about what's going to happen to you tomorrow or what you want to do tomorrow or after the lecture is over or five minutes from now. Now, I presume that a typical animal doesn't have some view about what they want to have happen to them over the course of their entire lifetime, but it's pretty clear that animals have desires with regard to their future, right? You know, they... they, they the squirrel puts the nuts away, and I take it has some thought about retrieving the nuts when it's winter and it needs something to eat. Uh, you know, birds have views about I'm going to take this worm back to my nest and feed my you know children uh, and so forth. So it seems to me, you know, again, we could pursue this further if anybody wants to, but you know, it seems to me that there are variations in terms of how future regarding you go. Uh, which aspects of your life? I mean, sometimes people say, you know, look, animals don't make choices. But that just seems wrong. That animals don't make choices. You know, you give, uh, you, know, you let the dog out, and it chooses to go run that way versus go run that way. It shall ch chase the squirrel or, you know, chase its own tail. Um, uh, I mean, that's obviously not as grand a choice as you make when you say, shall I chase the truth and become a philosophy student, or shall I chase my own tail and go into business? Um, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a less extreme version of the same thing. And so it just seems to me that the relevant truth about the property autonomy is it comes in degrees. It comes in more or less. And, crucial next point, is that animals may not have full grade or 100% best issue autonomy, but they've got, you know, they may, not have, they may not have A quality autonomy, but they've got B quality autonomy or C quality autonomy. Okay. So here's an obvious proposal to make. If some feature grounds deontological status, then if you've got some of that feature you've got some deontological status. If you've got more of that feature or in a purer or higher grade or more sophisticated or more complex form, uh, then you've got higher deontological status. But, crucially, if you have less of it, you still have, as long as you've got some of it, you've got some deontological status. Now, if that's the way we went, 
then the right conclusion would not be the Nozickian one, which again I want to repeat, it's not actually his position. It just frees me from constantly repeating the slogan. If the right conclusion isn't the Nozickian one, that animals don't have deontological standing at all, it's that they have deontological standing, but of a lesser sort. That the, the rights, the deontological rights they have will be the same deontological rights that we have, but weaker ones, uh, for example. That seems to me actually the conclusion the deontologist should be drawn to. And so in uh, a, a couple of minutes, I'll say something about, well, you know, what would it look like to have that kind of level of autonomy adjusted deontological theory? And of course, since I think that this feature about autonomy, which I'm sure, you know, those of you who were here yesterday, probably everybody who was here today was here yesterday, I don't know, um, can, will at least think, oh, I can see the connection between, between that and the kind of agency stuff that I was talking about uh, yesterday. So what we're going to really, and, and that agency stuff was relevant to, so, you know, these capacities for thinking about bigger or shorter stretches of the future and narrower or wider uh, dimensions of my life. Uh, and and, and uh, to what extent am I conscious of myself as having views about... So as we ramp up the autonomy-relevant capacities, status is going up, given the kind of view I was suggesting yesterday. So what all of this is pointing to, which strikes me as the way the deontologist should go, is, yeah, we should have autonomy, level of autonomy-adjusted deontology, but that's just to say we should have hierarchy adjusted uh, uh, deontology, where the hierarchy is not the kind of exclusionary hierarchical view, where animals get kept out of the deontological realm altogether, but rather it's a within deontology hierarchy, where animals have deontological standing, but lesser uh, the lower their status. All right, that seems to be the way to go, and in a minute, I'll, in a couple of minutes, I'll try to say something about, you know, some details about that. But, but there is another view you might be attracted to with regard to this remark about, yeah, you could concede, yeah, autonomy comes in degrees, but maybe there's a minimal amount of autonomy that you need. Enough autonomy. Again, we would talk about a threshold, except there's a danger here that you'll get confused with the kind of thresholds I've just been talking about up here. But uh, there's, there's some qu quantity of enough autonomy and maybe if you don't have enough autonomy, even if you have some autonomy, you don't get deontological status at all. Anybody tempted by that will notice that this will still leave two problems from yesterday. Um, just so you're not thinking you're escaping some of the problems I admitted and that my view has. You're still going to have to worry about marginal cases humans that are so cognitively impaired that they don't qualify as people. Um, well, you know, anybody that doesn't qualify as people, you know, of course, we haven't yet said how much autonomy is enough, but my guess is that people drawn to this view are going to have the, the, the minimal level pretty high, and then you're going to be stuck saying that marginal humans don't meet it. On the other hand, if you lower it enough to include the marginal humans, then you're letting back at least you know, a fair num amount of the animal kingdom. Indeed, maybe all of it, depending on how impaired the humans are that you're going to insist on giving deontological protections. So let's suppose we keep the threshold amount, enough autonomy, fairly high. So now this, this view still does have the problem of marginal cases, so you're not escaping that. Furthermore, we still have, for those of us that have enough, well, there'll still be people who have enough, but just barely enough. And there'll be other people who have enough and a lot more than that. Or autonomy comes in degrees. And so you're still going to have the problem of what I called normal variation, uh, where will it or won't it be the case that uh, among the people in this room, some of us have stronger deontological rights than others uh, by virtue of our greater or weaker um, uh, degree of autonomy? So that problem's not avoided either. But all right, that's at least what you could get if you... And, and then you might also wonder about the super superior beings. Could there be creatures that, you know, maybe we're pretty autonomous, but maybe there are higher degrees of autonomy yet. Um, uh, Kantians talk about holy wills, right? even more autonomous than, than we are. So 
you know, all three problems that I would say in the kind of hierarchy view I believe in, you know, they haven't disappeared. They've just re-emerged in slightly different guise. But for all that, I don't think this threshold idea is plausible. So the, the basic idea, again, was you need to have enough. You have to have enough autonomy to have deontology. And less than that doesn't count at all for deontological purposes. Whereas what I want to say is, no, less should count for somewhat, but less. And, and, and here, I've just got to say, look, it's not that there's anything logically incoherent about saying, here's how much autonomy you have to have. It's that it seems inexplicable why it would be so. It seems as though, of course, you could, you could also deal with the problem of normal variation at this point by saying, look, less than this amount, I, I, there's a line here on the stage's watch coming back here for the threshold. I can see it even though you can't. So, uh, you know, less than this amount of autonomy, that doesn't give you any standing at all. More than this amount of, of autonomy, maybe we solve the problem of superior beings and normal variation by saying, that doesn't give you any more at all. It's a kind of on-off thing. Yeah, that's logically coherent, but why would it work like that? It seems to me as though in the absence of an explanation, we shouldn't expect it to work like that. Now, there are examples that get thrown around that are uh, meant to show you, oh, no, this kind of thing that I've just been saying is kind of arbitrary and ad hoc isn't arbitrary and ad hoc uh, at all. Um, uh, an example from John Rawls, great 20th century uh, uh, moral and political philosopher, uh, was uh, a distance and circles. Um, he says, okay, so, you know, so here's the center of the circle, here's the circle, you know, here's your distance, smaller, greater. Um, and he says, look, there's a threshold amount of distance such that if you are less far from the center, you're in the circle. And if you're farther than that, you're outside the circle. Uh, and there's no degree here. I mean, of course, distance comes in degrees, but in and out of the circle doesn't come in degrees. You're either in the circle or you're not in the circle. So Rawls says there's nothing puzzling about the sort of view that I've just been poo-pooing. And yet, for all that, I want to continue poo-pooing it. I, I, it's, it seems to me that, of course, we can, we can draw any threshold we want and define the logical distinction, I have more than this or less than this. The question we have to be asking ourselves is, why would it matter in this on-off kind of a way whether you have just a little more than that, just a little less than that, and that having you know, a lot less than that doesn't matter, it's all the same beyond that. I, the only kind of halfway intelligible story I can come up with is something like this. Suppose there were some other property that was varied, correlated with, let's say, distance, such that if you have less than this distance, you've got the other property, if you've got more than this distance, you don't have that property. And it's that other property that's on-off, because distance isn't. I mean, that was very abstract, but it's easy to see how things like that could work. Imagine that what this distance does is, this is um, some kind of pavilion that's circular, and here's the center of the pavilion, and it's raining. So if you're less than a certain distance from the center of the pavilion, then, of course, you're under the roof, and you're not getting wet. If you're more than that distance, uh, then, of course, you're not under the roof, and so you aren't getting wet. That's getting wet here is kind of on-off, uh, and so it's not that we couldn't have things like that, but the way it, we got it was precisely because it wasn't really distance per se that was doing the moral work. It was that distance is correlated with this other property, under the roof or not under the roof. That's really doing the moral work. Okay, so the fans of autonomy, once they've conceded, they may not concede, but once they concede, as I think they should concede, that autonomy comes in degrees, if they're going to appeal to a threshold, they need to say something like, there's some other property such that if you're less autonomous than this, you don't have any of this other property. But if you're more autonomous than this, you've, you've got enough to have this other property, uh, and that property could be on off, and so that's yeah. There's there's space for something like that, uh, but then of course the point is that it's that 
other property that's really doing the philosophical explanatory work, the, the, the counterpart of the roof. And merely noting that there could be something like that isn't remotely anything like actually pointing to some second property that is on-off. That, then it's plausible to think grounds deontology, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and is correlated in this way. So all I can say is I can't think of one. I, I can't think of one on behalf of the deontologist that will both be plausible, or at least reasonably plausible as a ground of deontology, and yet on off. We could even throw away the correlation with autonomy if we wanted and just switch to that. You know, just say that you know, we and maybe some of the great apes or something have this special property, F, whatever it is, and other animals below that. Maybe whales have it too, but you know, whatever. Other animals don't have it. Sure, there could be an on-off property that grounds deontology such that we have it. Having excess of it doesn't really matter. Having to, you know, not having it at all uh, um, uh, you know, well, if you don't have it at all, you haven't got it at all. But it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, that's what's going on. It's another thing to point to a plausible candidate. So if any of you have any proposals about what you think that candidate should be, then I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear it, because I can't come up with anything. The, the usual suspects, like autonomy, actually come in degrees, and then absent just this ad hoc insistence, there's some threshold that for... No clear reason whatsoever. A little bit less than that's not enough. I don't find that uh, sufficiently attractive. So I think the deontologist should go with the view that's not the Nozickian view, animals don't fall under deontology at all, but they should instead go with the view according to which animals have rights, deontological rights, like the sorts we take ourselves to have in our deontological moods, but they have lesser rights or weaker rights or the rights need to be adjusted for hierarchy in something like an analogy to the way I was talking about how value theory needs to be adjusted for hierarchy. So let me take a, 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 the, the next several minutes, maybe all of what I've got left, depending on uh, how, much, how long it takes me, to, to sketch a couple of things about what that kind of deontology might look like, or at least where are, there, where are some places where that might uh, uh, show up. So you'll all be thinking, because this is, of course, how I got us into the problem in the first place, that what, we, what I wanted to do was make it justified for Tom Hanks to uh, eat the fish or eat the deer. I should say, by the by, that I just want to remind you, maybe remember my uh, confession slash concern at the start of um, uh, yesterday's lecture where I said that I give these talks with some misgivings because in the course of defending the notion that animals count less than people, I'm worried that the takeaway that some people might have would be, oh, so it's okay to treat animals the way that we do treat them, and I don't think that's at all true. And now I've been going on for, you know, gosh, 45 minutes or so arguing about how poor Tom Hanks gets to eat the deer, gets to eat the fish. And so, you know, it, you might be, I'm worried that you're going to think, oh, so what Charlie Kagan was just doing was arguing it's okay for me to go get a hamburger at the pub. No, it's not okay for you to go get a hamburger at the pub because you don't have the kind of necessity which I've been stipulating in the Tom Hanks case. You know, the, for you, we'd have to talk about not about keeping you alive for a year, uh, but the marginal extra pleasure you might get out of uh, eating animal protein versus soy protein or something like that. And that's going to be very, very small, even if you really, really love hamburger. Okay, so having once again warned you, please don't misunderstand where I'm going, I nonetheless want to sketch what a hierarchy, hierarchical sensitive uh, deontology might look like. So we, to, to, to get there, we, we first need to ask ourselves, what does the threshold function look like for uh, people? Right? And then we'll see how you might adjust that uh, for, uh, uh, for animals. And unsurprisingly, you know, it turns out to be complicated, like everything else in moral philosophy does. Uh, uh, but I'm going to at least point to some plausible thoughts to, to, to make here. And so I don't know what to do about the fact that if I have the graph pointed this way, you guys can see it and you guys can't, but that's life. Um, uh, 
So look, the, the simple function that I had up uh, a moment ago, which I just you know, turned the page over, was that the threshold equals a thousand times the amount of harm that you did. And, well, a thousand was the number that, where I begin to get some traction among my students, but many people hold out for a larger number, and some people hold out for a smaller number. So there's going to be some number, t equals, you know, for some multiplier, t equals m times h. So the idea is for a sufficiently large m, you've got, it's got to be the case that uh, uh, the amount of good you're doing is equal to or more than m times the amount of harm that you're imposing. And that sort of view, if we were to try graphing the threshold function, so let the x-axis be the amount of harm you're doing and let the y-axis be the amount of good that you need to do, then this is basically, the threshold function looks like this. It's a straight line, goes to the origin. You know, it's just, after all, this is just, this is just you know, y equals mx, um, uh, you know, which you remember from your geometry classes. Uh, so that would be a fairly simple take on what the threshold function might look like. And, and then the crucial question is just, how big is m anyway? And we could debate that, but that would at least be the, the logical form of the threshold function. On the other hand, it's, I think a lot of people will be drawn to the thought that the line here really shouldn't be straight. To have the line be straight is to suggest that as we increase the amount of harm that you're imposing, not only is it true that the amount of good that you must impose increases, it increases in a linear fashion. But, but you know, a lot of people might think, no, you know, as the harms get bigger and bigger, the threshold function increases disproportionately. Uh, that is to say, it becomes harder and harder, disproportionately speaking, to justify violation of the, the, the right not to be harmed. So maybe the threshold function, and I won't do this well, but, you know, it should look something more like that. Again, so the thought is just, it's just not linear. For, for increasing amounts of harms, uh, the amount of uh, uh, good that needs to be done is disproportional. So, so that would be something, not necessarily, but again, to keep things relatively simple, that would be something like m times h to the n. That is, to, to get the exponential growth, we throw in an exponent up here for the amount of harm. Still going to have some sort of multiplier. Um, so that's another view about how the threshold function might work. But even that's probably simpler than a lot of people want to accept. Um, uh, notice that as we reduce the amount of harm, uh, the amount of good that you need to do approaches zero because the line goes through the origin. Now, of course, there are no cases where you've harmed the person, but the amount of harm is zero. But the idea is it's approaching zero. It's as though if there were a harmless harm, there'd be no you know, greater amount of good that you needed to do. And that may not be the view that uh, we accept in our deontological moods. Maybe the view that we accept is something more like this, where the idea is as you reduce harm, the you know, threshold goes down, but it doesn't go down to zero. It's not approaching zero. There's a kind of residual badness, objectionableness to harming uh, creatures that are defended by deontological standing uh, that's there even as harm approaches uh, zero. So this would be something like the threshold equals the multiplier times h to the nth plus some extra term that represents the y-intercept. This is very Mickey Mouse math, but still a lot of people haven't done this kind of math for a long time. So, so if, if, if you're not following these equations, don't worry about it. Because all that really matters is you take my word for it, that there were <laughs> about everything. Just take my word about everything. That there are three coefficients that showed up in this threshold function. M, the original multiplier, N, the exponential value, and A, the extra term that we added in case we don't want the, the wrongness to, all right. So now we see, if something at least is in the ballpark, now we see what a hierarchical deontology might begin to look like. It's that the values of these coefficients might vary with your moral status, such that... Uh, you know, high-status creatures have 
relative, you know, high autonomy creatures like you and me, people, we have high values of M and N and A. And low status creatures have lower values for M and N and A. And of course, if you have lower values for M and N and A, M and N and A, then the upshot is going to be even when you plug the same amount of harm into the function, you're going to get a smaller value for t. Look, that leg has just gotten shorter. It's, it's now wounded in action. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if it's really, you can't fix it, let's just put it, out, put it outside. I don't think we're really going to need it anymore. Is there some? Oh, there's something to turn here. You bet I can. You can't. And neither can I. Okay, never mind. So uh, let's, let's just put it down. And now I can't put it down. <laughs> Apparently, this, this part of the lecture is doomed to failure. Yeah. And thus we take care of. <laughs> yeah. All right, so look, the, the thought was there's a bunch of places where status could. Now that we've seen we must adjust our deontology for status, there's a bunch of places where status could come in. Uh, it's not crazy to think that. The thought was, all right, so if it's going to be okay for Tom Hanks to eat the deer, it, the threshold had better be lower. How do we get the threshold to be lower? By adjusting M and or N and or A. Indeed, a more intriguing theory, more complicated still, might be maybe different kinds of features adjust one of the coefficients and not others, right? And so it may not all be lockstep. But as long as status can adjust those coefficients, it can adjust the threshold. Of course, you know, we have to adjust it enough so as to get the result that it's okay to uh, kill the deer in the Tom Hanks case. But, you know, at least in principle, now the door becomes open. Let me mention just... Oh, just two or three other points, and I'll try to bring this to an end very quickly. Uh, so, so one is, unsurprisingly, there are more complicated threshold functions yet. Uh, but again, as you make the formula more complicated, that just uh, makes it easier and easier to point to places where, oh, look, hierarchy might adjust this term, might adjust that coefficient, uh, and, and so forth and so on. So it seems to me that something like that is the way that a deontologist needs to go. Point number one. Point number two, suppose we had the threshold for uh, adjusted, a hierarchy adjusted threshold. Then there'd be further questions, let me, many, many other questions, but let me just mention two of them very, very quickly. One is, in order to meet the threshold, right, the thought is, when is overriding the right permissible from a moderate deontological perspective? Uh, the answer is, well, you know, how much good are you doing? All right? Now, the beneficiaries in the example I've been harping on has been a human. But we could tell other stories where the beneficiaries aren't humans, but are rather other animals. And then you've got to remember the point that I was trying to uh, persuade you of yesterday, whether successfully or not, that we need a hierarchy-adjusted welfare function as well, so that adding a unit of animal well-being doesn't necessarily do as much good and that means that, you know, just supposed to slap numbers on it, if in order to justify this amount of harm, we needed 10 units of good, it's going to take more well-being by animals to meet the threshold than it will take well-being by, by people. And there are other issues here as well. Uh, so that, for, for example, suppose that um, we ask ourselves, does any kind of good from a beneficiary, count towards meeting the threshold. A lot of people have the intuition that uh, if the good that's being added in towards meeting the threshold amount is too small, it shouldn't count. You know, it's one thing to say we're going to justify killing an innocent person so as to save lives or maybe even to save limbs. Uh, but by the time you're talking about saving licks on the lollipop, that doesn't even seem like, to a lot of people, no number of licks on the lollipop could add up. They're, they're too small to count. Uh, the metaphor I th always think of here is kind of, they're small potatoes, right? And the thought is that to harm somebody from a deontological perspective, you can't count towards meeting the threshold things that are too small potatoes. 
I thought, to be very quick about it, it's as though we say something like, if the harm is H, then the potatoes that are being added in on the balance scale have to be at least H divided by N or more for some suitable N. And so the last thought is, maybe the size of N also is a hierarchy sensitive uh, a feature, so that, as it were, a potato that is too small to count when we're talking about justifying overriding the right of a person might be quite large enough to, over, to justify overriding the harm of an animal, even for the same size harm, by virtue of the fact that their lower status uh, means that the size of the relevant potatoes gets adjusted as well. Uh, this just gives you a glimmer of the kinds of modifications that need to be done to deontology once you introduce hierarchy. Uh, and you know, for those of you who have yet to have had enough, what I'm going to do tomorrow is take a more extended look at yet another example uh, and uh, conclude with some thoughts about foundations of ethics. But uh, maybe that's enough for today. Thank you.